Good evening. How many of you folks live in a rural community? I'm needing a little support here. <laughs> Can I get a testimony for rural communities? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to welcome my homies that are here with me, uh, wherever you are. <laughs> Love you guys, and um, it's wonderful to see so many of our friends. I just saw Clyde, uh, CW, and I, I thought, I said, you know, you look like you've been to heaven. He's resurrected over there. It's beautiful. Praise the Lord. Um, well, I'm here to give a small testimony in praise of rural communities, where we touch the soil every day, and we will leave the light on for you when you need refuge from one of the great cities of the world. I am married to an apple farmer. I met him in traffic court. He was there for going too slow. <laughs> Story of our lives. In a sports car. I was there for going too fast. In a station wagon. But, <laughs> out of that strange beginning, we came to realize that we had been called, chosen, to um, live out a shared vision they would center around an apple farm and the people that were sent there to farm it with us. It has given us our reason for living. Ralph was uh, actually 15. You know about that age when you think kids are brain dead? Uh, when he got his first glimpse of God's call on his life. It was more like a daydream uh, floating through. A missionary came from India, was talking about kids that were dying from uh, a famine at that time. And Ralph says he remembers uh, thinking, wouldn't it be cool to, to have an orchard and uh, help kids? So a few years later, although we had to sell that little sports car so that we could get married, we did um, scrounge up enough money to uh, put down on a cherry orchard. But um, two weeks after we signed the deal, the uh, crop that was on the trees, it was spring, uh, froze out. The next year it rained out. The next year, we got a cherry fruit fly infestation. No crop. Call born out of suffering, amen. Um, no reason we should have been left on that farm. We owed a lot of money. We didn't have any when we started. We were working now for other people just to pay for our own rent and food. But our dream team didn't give up on us. And I don't know if it's because uh, we were the son and daughter of pioneer families in our area upon whose um, reputational collater collateral we, will, we were able to draw or uh, whether they just believed in our dream but uh, the bank didn't foreclose, the uh, former owner didn't take the farm back and we hung on. And eventually we uh, made a crop. And then another one and another one, I think about the fourth one, we were able to pay off our back debts. When we first started farming, it was white U.S. citizens that came to work on our farm. They came from places like Texas. They would follow the crops to be harvested across uh, to California, up the West Coast, make their way over into the uh, fields of eastern Washington State before returning to their homes again in the South for the winter. However, times were changing. It seemed to me like all of a sudden, we no longer had white families coming to work in our fields. Now it was mostly young Latinos showing up to apply for jobs. They came with little or nothing, spoke no English, and we sure spoke no Spanish. And since it seems like everything you do on a farm is time sensitive, it needs to be done now or the bugs will ruin the fruit or the fruit will not go correctly or it will rot on the trees or the birds will get it. Needless to say, things can become quickly chaotic. So how do you form a team around a shared vision with folks who have never done that kind of work before with whom you can't communicate, with words anyway, and do it fast? Since we had learned most of what we knew about farming on the job, we just continued the same way with our new employees, by doing it together. When leadership grows from the ground up, we've found that different qualities are important than those we look at when we look at leadership from the top down, when you already know everything. You know you don't know everything. You hardly know nothing about nothing when you're starting from the ground up. 
But showing up every day with 100% of your spirit like our people do, day after day, good days and bad days, it counts for a lot. Not being afraid to ask questions is critical. Reaching out and asking for help that anybody will listen, absolutely. Being, being willing to lay down things that aren't working and pick up things that might work, you don't waste time. Sharing what you've learned with the guy next to you, it's pretty exciting. Hey, look what I learned to do today. You know, the, uh, the more, the more um, what do I say, accomplished we get, I think that's when we start thinking, well, let's see, how much of this information do I really need to share with you anyway? Because after all, it might cut into my turf. This process has uh, given us a profound belief in the capacity of human beings to learn, to grow, to create, and achieve their own dreams if just given a chance to learn and put that learning into practice. A lot of these men were just boys, and I'm speaking about the field now primarily. This was before we had a warehouse. They, they were just boys when they came. But as they uh, grew up over the years, they were becoming very good farmers, and today they are world-class farmers. We followed this method of experiential learning because it was the only thing we knew how to do. We are practitioners. And it has become our story of learning how to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. Sojourner, there is no road. You make the road by walking. See, when immigrants really started coming to our farm, we had just planted the first baby trees on the Snake River after having sold everything we owned and basically starting over again for the third time. This time, it was a time of recession. The interest rate went to 22%. The bank wouldn't give us an operating loan. It was a time of high unemployment as industrial jobs were being outsourced to countries with cheaper labor. And the only people showing up to apply for work on our farm, nobody seemed to like. So, what to do when you're trying to run a business? We decided to take our family to Mexico over Christmas to see if we could find out what was going on there that was causing so many people to come north. What we came to realize over the next few years as we made trip after trip was that these folks were really economic refugees having lost the ability to provide food security for their children they finally just walked off their lands and headed north many of them migrated to the big cities of mexico but many others not being able to find work there kept heading north and so the exodus continues today somewhere during that time of discovery i came across a quote by pope paul the sixth in his 1969 pastoral on the care of immigrants. It gave us the moral permission to claim our work as a calling by God to serve these people. He said, the human right to work and to feed the family precedes the right of a nation to control exit from and entrance to its borders. The human right to tend the garden, our first job description, tend the garden. You know, in our depths, we know that we have gifts to give. It's, they've been given to us by our Creator, and when we can't give them, well, many of us just shut down and become depressed. Others become very angry about that. They may not understand why they're so angry. This our God-given um, work to do. In 1987, we decided then to build a packing plant. It was costing a lot of uh, our profit to send our apples 100 miles away to be packed at the time, and fruit can get really beat up being trucked that far. But we also did it because it was a way that we could provide 150 more jobs for people because we, really, we were convinced by them that these people were desperate for jobs so that they could take care of their families. And we needed workers. They need jobs. Because we hired women for our warehouse jobs, we began hearing stories about the reality that they and their families were living at the time. 
Over 80% of Latino students were dropping out of school. Older kids were kept home to take care of younger kids. Sometimes little children were just left alone for the day because mom and dad were finally both able to work, make a few more bucks. And they were far away from their communities of origin. Uh, there were very few grandmas or aunties around in those days to take care of the children. So, when we built the warehouse and started hearing all those stories, we decided to build an on-site daycare center across from the warehouse, and we soon learned that children are the door to the family. We became aware of many health and social issues that had never been addressed because their families had lived continually on the move in search of jobs for so long that they had never stayed put long enough to address their deeper needs. Emotional issues, mental issues, physical health, many had never seen a dentist, domestic violence, substance abuse. Housing was in short supply, and many families were living in substandard conditions. One family I particularly remember uh, was living in a garage, and their little boy was being bitten by rats at night. Our people needed decent, affordable housing closer to the job. So we decided to build some houses across the street from our warehouse. Although we tried to partner with a number of state housing programs for low-income tax credit funding, it turned out that now that both mom and dad were working, they were making too much money for us to qualify. <laughs> and so in 1990, we decided to take out a loan and we built 100 uh, two, three, and four bedroom homes. Our first residents named the community. They, they named our community, of all things, Vista Hermosa, which means beautiful view. It wasn't beautiful at the time. But later, we kind of, we kind of understood why. Um, a third of those families, when they moved in, disclosed to us that uh, their children had been involved or exposed in varying degrees to prior gang activities. They were desperately seeking a safe refuge for their families. Here was fruit in the form of children that was in danger of not lasting. It's one of the reasons that a few years later we started a residential program, Jubilee Youth Ranch, that offers second chances to teens who've been so bruised by life that they're starting to rot, just like apples do. Now, I brought here two apples for you, picked a couple days ago. This is a honey crisp. See how nicely formed it is? Unique as it is, um, it apparently got the right, enough of the right nutrients, a good environment, and it is a very sellable apple today. Healthy meat, nice apple. This poor thing, it, uh, it did not. I don't know if you can see that. It did not get all the nutrients it needed, uh, calcium in particular, my husband tells me. And uh, what we have here is known as bitter pit. Bitter pit. And once bitter pit starts to set in on an apple, there's no redeeming it. It's garbage. Do any of you feel like you've ever had bitter pit start to set in in your lives? Thank God we are not like this apple because we have witnessed in our own community over and over again how the love of God can restore a rotting soul. <laughs> At this Hermosa, it became very clear to us that God was doing the choosing here and God had chosen us not only to bear fruit in the form of apples and cherries but to bear fruit that will last in the lives of our people. Our business was to become a place of ministry, a business ministry, a real community of people working together for the common good, where every person counts, whether you're the last one over the fence or you've been with us for 40 years. We need you. We want to know what you got to bring to the table so we can keep this wheel rolling and the bills paid, and our families cared for, and our children in school. I, uh, I appreciated hearing Al Sharpton on TV the other night, and he was reminding us uh, that you, he said, you cannot work for the civil rights of one 
without working for the civil rights of all. We built a gym and a chapel front and center in our community, along with a little mom and pop type grocery store and a, and a laundromat and a soccer field. Since then, we've added a, a elementary school. We, uh, we hired a few of our people to come up with some community activities. I mean, we were playing this by ear. You know, we, we were apple farmers one day and we were trying to be social workers the next day. Not. <laughs> we needed help. <laughs> and uh, since we're all out there together, kind of, you know, out there in the wilderness, we just look at each other and say, what can you do? Right, Eva? Where are you? <laughs> all right, dear. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we make it down the road together. Um, so uh, those folks uh, put programs for everything from after school tutoring to sports teams to summer day camp in place. And we made a college scholarship fund available for children of our employees. 20 years down the road from the creation of Vista Hermosa, I I can report that most of our young people are graduating from high school. And many are choosing to go on for higher education and college. Graduates are coming out professionally trained to take on desperately leaded, needed leadership positions in communities all around, including our own. But it's not easy for them. Many live in a constant fear of being deported. For some, it's become a chronic low-grade depression, knowing they're not wanted here, yet foreigners in their countries of origin. We're so proud right now in our community. We're celebrating the life of Yvonne, who grew up in our community and not only graduated from high school, but went to the university and graduated from there. And you know, it was, it was due in large part to the fact that even when her parents couldn't be there for her all the time, they had other issues they were tending to. Other people in our community, like Eva, stepped up and became a second mother for her, and she made it. In a week or so, Yvonne is going to Washington, D.C. to work with the National Organization on Immigration Issues. Can you believe that? You know, um, five of the nine of my grandbabies are half Mexican now. And it, it hurts me to see my grandson, Felipe, cry because the cousin of his daddy, who's Mexican, died in the border in the Arizona desert trying to come to this country. He got sick, and the group he was with said, sorry, but we can't wait. They said they'd send help but he died. It hurts me now because I'm connected to that man. It makes me wonder, is it possible for this country once again to bring itself to do the right thing for millions of people, especially those brought here as babies and toddlers? They have more than paid their dues who are contributing to the welfare of every sector of our society whose human rights, let alone civil rights, are becoming fewer every day? Or will we remain the inhospitable innkeeper? In our community, the parents of those children who have mostly learned their professions while on the job, like we all did, are now increasingly involved in leading community development work both at home and abroad. We work in about seven different countries. One of my favorite stories is in Mexico. Our community's been working there for five years with uh, 80 small apple growers. Now, some of these guys have only 100 trees. They were suffering from a lack of just about everything. Uh, money, markets, um, weather protection, infrastructure, roads, cold storage facilities. First, their sons and their families started leaving to find work elsewhere. Later, many of their fathers followed. In the town of Camacho, one of the many communities that we're working in, 370 people had lived there in 1979. Do you know how many people live in your community? Do you know their names? 
I'll bet Evan knows the name of every single person in our community. But due to a, lacking, a growing lack of food security, almost everyone had left that town. Then we were given the opportunity to see what we might be able to do to help them redeem their farms, one farm community to another. We sent delegations of our farmers down there and they sent delegations of their farmers to our community. When we went down to visit the Chihuahua farmers last month, we visited the village of Camacho. We were driven past house after house whose walls are crumbling down, where cows are grazing instead of children playing, crops growing. There we met with 15 farmers in their community center, and they told us that today 160 people have returned to the town of Camacho. They are trying to make another go of doing what they love, farming. Their crops have doubled and tripled, and we're now working on a cold storage facility. It's too early to tell about the long-term sustainability. Their challenges are immense and enormous. But the spirit they bring to their work, the love they have for the land, it makes us up for the ride. One other story. In the Vidarbha region of India, there are thousands of small cotton farmers. As the effects of globalization have set in, these farmers have been pressured to buy hybrid seeds that need to be purchased every year. They were told they needed expensive fertilizers. To get them, they took out loans from lenders who charged huge interest rates. So high, in fact, that the farmers would never be able to pay off their debts or realize an increase in their income. So, thousands of them have resulted to suicide. Thousands. Hoping that their families might somehow be let off the hook, they drink the expensive pesticides they purchased and die, leaving their families without fathers or livelihoods. So, over the last three years, our community has partnered with World Vision in this project in just one specific area of Verdarba to renegotiate loans and introduce sustainable farming techniques. In that region, just that little region, I'm proud to say not one farmer has committed suicide in three years. It's only one little region. There are still thousands of other farmers that are killing themselves. But in one little region, there's a ray of hope. Because of the experiences we've lived, our passion, as you can tell, is to stand with struggling, vulnerable communities of folks who've decided that they want to be together and work for the common good. In fact, it has been said that ethics is how we act when we decide that we belong together. Do we belong together? Ethics is how we behave when we decide that we belong together. Just as we believed 30 years ago that our employees and their children who would come to live and work on our farm were to be our fruit that will last, today it is those who have become our partners in mission we thought all they needed was a job. How nice of us to give them a job. Heck, we needed them more than they needed us. <laughs> and now, together, we are able to reach out to other communities. It is they that are increase increasingly rebuilding the broken walls, and it is they who are restoring the streets of dwellings that Isaiah 58 speaks about. It is they who are bringing glimpses of the kingdom of God on earth. Thank you.